day, welcome back to the channel. Something unusual today, something a little different. I found this, I've got a lot of these old magazines. You've seen I've done Popular Mechanics, Popular Science before. Popular Electronics. Now this was nowhere near as widespread as, and it didn't last as long I don't think. Well maybe it did, maybe I got some Popular Mechanics from the 70s, I can't remember. But this one goes back a bit. How long ago was this one? Um, it's got a date on here somewhere, it's 19 something or other. Where's the date? Oh, on the back. No, it doesn't say date there. Hang on, we have to look inside. July 1958. Okay, so this is like, you can work that out for yourselves how long ago that one was. It's, uh, let's see, 60, 40, 20 years. 60 years old, isn't it? Something, yeah, 60, over 60 years old. 61 years old. Let's have a look at what electronics was like 61 years ago today. Well, not today, but roughly. Anyway, so. This is typical magazines of the 50s. There's, uh, there's the, the wife and the, and the husband and their reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, which was an essential part of every home. It wasn't actually, but uh, there we go. Right, kits. There were lots of kits. Kits were big back in the 50s. Um, companies like Heathkit and others were built on the kit business. And the other thing that was really big was self teaching, you know, correspondence schools and, and learning a new trade. Electronics was really big back then. Um, it was slightly before the transistor era. Transistors, or, you know, transistors were just coming in, I think, in 58. They'd been invented a few years earlier, so they were making a bit of an appearance. But electronics were going to change the world. They were used by the military. They were used, television was getting really big, radio was already big. So if you learned about electronics, you'd have a job for life. That was the theory. So hmm, how does it work? And uh, what have we got here? Um, look, satellite, satellite dish. Um, oh, quartz crystals. Uh, I remember going back to the 70s. Um, yeah, when you wanted to build uh, an, a receiver or a transmitter, this is before the days of synthesized phase lock loops and fancy digital circuitry. You just went and got a crystal cut to the right frequency. You'd order a crystal at a certain frequency, wait a few weeks, and back would come your order. There's your crystal, plug it in, bing, operates at the frequency you chose. It was one way to get really good uh, results with locked receivers and transmitters. So, and these were pretty cheap, 99 cents each. That's pretty damn cheap. And if you had CB radio, of course, you remember, you had crystals for every channel back in the early days before they had synthesizers. Um, oh my goodness, a high fidelity speaker. That would not qualify as high fidelity today. And it's an outside, inside or outside one too. Let's have a look what else we've got here. Again, more career future in electronics. Rockets, yes. If you want to build rockets. Oh, hey, this has got to be the feature of this magazine. And we think of home computers as being something relatively new. You know, there was the Apple and then there was the, the Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 and the, the other home computers came along. Now, I probably was one of the first home computer owners in New Zealand because I built my own way back in 1977. I built my first computer out of bits I had to import from overseas because you couldn't buy the processors and the RAM and all the other bits. You couldn't buy them here. I had to import them. It was a long story. I'll tell you about it one day. Anyway, so that was 1977 though. This is 20 years earlier. And look, build not just one home computer, but 125 home computers at home with the Geniac. And it's only 20 bucks, 20 bucks. This was, of course, um, a very, it wasn't the computers as we know it. It wasn't computers as we know it. it was, it's basically switchboard stuff and, and there may some analog in there as well. But hey, you could, you can see why these didn't take off, can't you? <laughs> Back then, no, no screen or anything. It's just, it's theory. But hey, there you go. Home computers were a thing in 1958. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that was a thing? But there they are. What else have we got here? Perfect hair. Oh, well, that's always going to be a bonus for me, isn't it? Was it perfect? Oh, perfect pair. Sorry. <laughs> How do I read that as perfect hair? I have no idea. Anyway, um, again, electronics technician. And of course, cartoons. There are always a few cartoons in there. Oh, if you think that your Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus is a swish looking phone, look at this! Walkie talkie radio telephones. And they were only $7.98. You could buy dozens of them, but of course you didn't get paid much in those days. But Springfield Enterprise would sell you a walkie-talkie radio phone. There you go. It wasn't actually a phone as we know. It was just a walkie-talkie with a telephone headset. You couldn't ring anybody on it. It had no dial. It was nothing. It was just walkie-talkie packaged in an interesting way. Uh, more international correspondence schools. More train yourself. You know, everyone's trying to upskill. Upskill doesn't happen so much today, does it? Which is a bit of a shame. Um, oh, I was saying kits. Here we go. Allied Night Kits. Build your own. What could you build? You could build yourself hi-fi, a transistor radio, test equipment, and ham radio stuff. Just there you go. And the prices were usually quite competitive compared to buying stuff. Um, 
Here we go. Again, look, more training, Age of Space, because this was a year, I think a year after Sputnik was launched. Was Sputnik 57? I'm not sure. So this was the beginning of the satellite era. And so everyone was thinking, Lunar Electronics, job for life. There you go. And again, um, training in radio and television, because radio and TV, we used to fix televisions and radios back in those days. They had valves and tubes and you could fix them. And they were so expensive that you wouldn't want to throw them out. I mean, these days you can buy yourself a 40 inch, in New Zealand, a 40 inch HD LCD TV set for 350 bucks. So if it breaks down, you throw it away and buy a new one because you just labor is so expensive, you can't afford to repair them. Back in these days, TV repair, man, that was a big job. That was a job that paid well and uh, the big demand for it. I was a TV repair man once, honestly, long time ago. Again, more home training, RCA Institutes. RCA, of course, was a big company in America, a recording company of America, and they built lots of electronic stuff and you could learn to service stuff through them. What else have we got? More kits, diner kits, more trainings. You can see where things were going. Training and kits. Um, what have we got here? The Irie Audio Amplifier. So you can build it yourself. It's got a PC board. More television training. And, and here we go. Look at those. Look at that fancy, fancy schematic, uh, fancy circuit board and the schematic for all sorts of stuff. Um, and Lafayette. That was a big name. Lafayette was a big name in American electronics. They did radios and all sorts of stuff. And here's a six transistor super hit receiver with the latest NPN PNP transistors. And how much was that? The complete kit was $29.95 for a kit that you had to build yourself. And remember, that's $1958. That's a fortune in modern money. Transistors were really expensive because they were really new. And again, we've just got more of the same, more of the same. Oh, and look, if you thought 3D color TV was recent, no, look, 3D color TV, 1958. Mind you, it wasn't uh, general broadcast stuff. It was, I think this was for a nuclear reactor or something where they used it for uh, doing dangerous stuff you wouldn't want to do yourself. And transistors replace wall outlet. That's it. I built one of these. This was uh, not this one, but a similar one, a simple transistor based voltage inverter. These were terrible. You could kill just about anything with these because it was a square wave device, didn't operate at 50 cycles a second or 60 in America, and it just turned 12 volts into 230 or 110 volts. And it was so noisy, there were so many transients, and the RMS value was all wrong, and it would just completely destroy sensitive electronics. So, mind you, there weren't that many sensitive electronic devices back in 58, so I suppose it was okay then, but I built some in the 60s and 70s, and I blew up heaps of stuff. It's great fun. And this was typical construction, tubes and a metal chassis and transformers and, and, and it was, that's the way we built stuff. And, and look at this, what a brilliant idea. Who'd have thought you could record video on tape? Ooh, yes, that's the way they did it back then, videotape. And another computer, look, look, the second home computer in the One magazine. This is an analog computer. I built one of these, a couple of uh, variable resistors and a multimeter, it's all you need. And you just basically, it calculates by varying the current through a circuit. Really, really simple. Um, and you can multiply, divide, add, and subtract with simple potentiometer circuits. There's the schematic, if you want to build one again at home. There's the little dials, which a bit like a slide rule, really, because being analog, you had to get the verniers directly over the thing to get the results to be accurate. Of course, the pots were really cheap and they didn't work. So it was an interesting exercise, but not very practical. Um, Recording on tape, the audio recordings on tape, this was big too because we didn't have cassettes even. We certainly didn't have MP3s or solid state recorders. It was all just onto tape. And it wasn't actually much long after the wire recorders of World War II. And there we go. This is, look at the compact audio equipment. Look at this. You can record in your car with this giant brick on the seat beside you. Fantastic. Your passenger has to sit in the boot or the trunk if you're in America. And let's not forget ham radio. See, amateurs help the tuna fleet. And there you go. I guess they had a radio tuner, did they? No, it did. Don't be silly, Bruce. Um, there we go. Um, and, oh yes, vehicle. If you think that the system, the audio system in your car is pretty smick, then Look at this, mate. This is Go Mobile with the AudioFi. Improve audio radio listenings with a novel enclosure. You think you've got a, uh, a subwoofer in your car now? Look, make it out of wood. Throw an old elliptical speaker. These were a thing. Elliptical speakers with built-in tweeters into your box. And there was your subwoofer. There was your, your audio system. That box you could throw in the back of the car. Away you go. Um, what have we got here? Um, I don't know. Build one of these. Is that radio control boat or something? No idea. Um... Antennas, everyone built their own antenna. Look, satellite reception. Think, hey, 58, did they have satellite TV back then? No, they'd only just launched the Sputnik. So satellite TV was not anywhere on the horizon. But you could build your antennas, 
your own antennas and point them in the sky and you can pick up things like the Sputnik, you know, the little early satellites that were going round and round and round. Notice there's no circularly polarised antennas, these are all linear so people can build them easily and so forth. But yeah, um, you could pick up orbiting satellites, not that there were many to pick up, but you could. Um, what have we got? Oh, some more hamster or radio, radio stuff to lick floods. Hmm. And there we go, here's Sputnik, see what I said, Sputnik. So this is the tone that Sputnik was broadcasting, just beep, 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 there you go. So you could use your antennae built on the earlier pages to receive that signal. Yeah. Oh, TV in a car, who'd have thunk? That would, the battery wouldn't last long there if you were parked up, would it? Um, and here we go, talking about propagation, this satellite, so you're learning a lot of stuff through these things. And you even learn how a vacuum tube voltmeter works. These were a thing. You had a tube inside your voltmeter so that it didn't load down the circuit you were measuring the voltage on. And again, um, one thing that was quite popular was shortwave radio. That's different from ham. Ham radio operators, they built their own gear and they transmitted and talked to each other. A lot of people just listened to shortwave radio because there was a lot of stuff there and there was no internet. So there was nothing else to do at night except procreate and listen to shortwave radio, so that's what they did. This was second choice, of course, or the other one came first. Um, there you go, and circuit diagrams, this is just a signal booster. They're getting longer range, getting weaker, weaker channels, weaker signals. Um, and what else have we got? Um, a delay line, mechanical delay line. Oh, this was so good, just a coil of stuff in a little mechanical transducers. And it's, um, it, they used it as memory at one stage for computers, believe it or not, short-term memory, um, just like mine. What else have we got? Tuner and audio radios. Again, this is another kit, another design. They used to put schematics in the magazines and you could build them yourself. Look, double triode output stage. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. Um, how your phonograph pickup works. There you go. Anyone remember phonograph records, round things, discs, you know, 45s, 33s? Those sort of disappeared from the face. Oh, no, there's a bit of a comeback, isn't there? There's a big revival in vinyl. Well, there you go. This is what all we had back then. We only had vinyl and the wax cylinders. <laughs> Otherwise, before my time. Microphones, which microphone should you use? And they just go through. So it's, a lot of the stuff is still in, um, in magazines today. A lot of it hasn't changed. Um, what have we got? This is just more ham stuff. So there's a lot of ham stuff. Now, how to get your ham license? Hi fi highlights. This is, oh, this is audio file stuff. Look at this. Old Apple boxes with speakers in them. Turntables, they're a thing, aren't they? Turntables, that devices for picking up dust and putting it on your record. There you go, yeah, what else has we got in here? Um, uh, some more sort of informative stuff, I don't know. There's a little neon thing there. Um, shortwave report, as I say, shortwave was a big thing. More training, uh, more tuners, more, more kits, more, Heath, there you go, Heath kit. The Heath company, that's when they developed the Heath kit products and put them on the market, and they were a really big company. I don't even know if they're still going now, though. But they were, so radio control gear used to be kit set. You could buy Heath kit radio control gear. A lot of people had it back in the 60s and the early 70s when radio control equipment was otherwise very expensive. Tips and techniques. Oh yeah, light bulb is a dummy load. That's what we used to use years and years ago. And now we're getting into the uh, tubes, and this is where the, the advertising comes in at the back. All the cool stuff you can buy, and then what's new on the market. Um, how to get your FCC license, and these magazines just generally degrade because it's all just carried on from articles that are in the front of the magazine. So, you, oh, a coaxial ballon, that's interesting, still applicable today if you're doing antennas, coaxial ballons, I use those sometimes to turn a balanced load into an unbalanced load and change the impedance. I might do a video on that actually, uh, because I notice a lot of the aerials, the dipoles that we have on a lot of this gear now, you know, your, your, like your Crossfire and your R9 equipment and so forth, they use a dipole and they connect it straight up to some coax, which is a no-no. It's, it's because you're connecting a balanced antenna to an, to an unbalanced feeder and you get problems. So a coaxial ballon is a great way to get around that. I might do a little video on that just to improve the performance of your antenna. Um, television, inventors, this is like popular mechanics, popular science, always looking for inventors with great inventions. Guns, there's always, there's American magazines, it's got to have guns in it, but it's a German automatic 22 caliber repeating pistol. Hmm, who'd have thought? Um, there's probably not a lot else in here. You get these ads at the back. Quite often they were like military surplus in the 1950s. Classified advertising for a good time. Phone, walkie-talkie, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. Um, there we go. Our tube tester. Tube tester. They're hard to find one today, but they were all the rage back then when tubes were the backbone of electronics. And obviously here, $36.50, you can check your own tubes. What's on the back cover? Oh, that's good. It's not a Marlboro ad like so often was the case, but it's just more... More test shipped on approval. Look at this amazing back then. They'd ship you stuff. You could try it out, see how it went, and if you liked it, you'd pay for it. 
So trusting, so trusting these people. Anyway, that's it. Electronics from 1958. Hope you enjoyed that. If you've got a question, 35 cents for that magazine. Although by the time I got to New Zealand, it was $5.25. Um, anyway, thanks for watching. If you like these videos, give it a thumbs up. I'll make some more. It's always nice to look back in time and realise how lucky we are today. And thank to my Patreon supporters. There were no mid-roll ads in this video. And there are support links in the description. If you want to support this channel, go and have a look at those links. Won't cost you a penny. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.